I am so glad you're here, and welcome to Organic Chemistry. I'm Dr. Rojas, and today we're diving into the fascinating world of aromatic compounds, benzylic reactions, the reduction of benzene, and heteroaromatic compounds in organic chemistry. First, let's explore the exciting reactions that occur at the benzylic positions. A benzylic position refers to a carbon that is adjacent to the benzene ring. So when you notice a benzene ring or its derivatives, the carbon that is adjacent to that ring indicates the benzylic position. And in this example, there are two benzylic carbon positions. Now these benzylic positions are rich in electron density, which makes them susceptible to various chemical transformations. Previously, we learned about various benzene derivatives such as phenol and bromobenzene. On this side, we see their counterparts, which are benzylic. For example, the first compound is benzyl alcohol, and the second compound is what is known as benzyl bromide. Now uniquely, these compounds undergo reactions that are incapable of happening at benzene rings. You'll recall that previously we said that benzene is incredibly stable, and the reason for this has to do with the conjugation of the pi molecular orbitals lying along each adjacent carbon atom for benzene, where these unhybridized p orbitals are capable of interacting and delocalizing electrons such that they remain incredibly stable. So if we're to consider what might happen during a transformation of benzene, we need to keep in mind that one of the hydrogen atoms at the carbon-hydrogen bond in benzene is going to need to form some sort of intermediate in order to perform a reaction. So if we're to consider, for example, a phenyl radical, which is drawn here, remember that all of the p orbitals on carbon are perpendicular to one another. So the py orbital may be going up and down, the px may be going left and right, and the pz might be coming in and out of the screen at you. Those are all perpendicular or 90 degrees to one another. So therefore, if we're to generate this radical in replacing what used to be a carbon-hydrogen bond, notice that this radical is not participating in conjugation with these other pi molecular orbitals because they are perpendicular to one another. In order for the orbitals to interact in conjugation, the orbitals actually have to be facing in the same axis or on the same plane. Now if we evaluate a benzyl radical, notice that we still have the same conjugation occurring between the pi molecular orbitals inside of that cyclic part of the compound, but then the carbon adjacent to it at the benzyl position has a radical in an unhybridized p orbital. This carbon position is sp2 hybridized, which leaves behind an unhybridized p orbital, and notice that it is on the same plane with the axes going parallel to one another so that we have an additional level of stability that occurs. For this reason, things like benzyl radicals, benzyl cations, and even benzyl anions are incredibly stable, especially when compared to their counterparts on a phenyl group or just a simple benzene ring. If you recall from previous chemistry courses, because of the stability of a carbon-hydrogen bond, it's actually incredibly difficult to perform transformations at those positions. One notable exemption is going to be when we learned about halogenation using what's called radical halogenation. So benzylic compounds, because they can stabilize benzyl radicals, can actually undergo a very similar transformation. And if you recall previously, we used reagents like NBS, or Br2 when shined with light to form a bromo radical, which would allow us to abstract one of these hydrogens. So if we are to generate a radical, this would generate our benzyl radical, at which point another bromo radical could come in and form a brand new chemical bond, which is exactly what happens in benzyl bromination. Another important reaction is what's called benzylic oxidation. Now depending on which reagents you use, a benzylic carbon-hydrogen bond is actually converted into an alcohol or a ketone or a carbonyl group depending on which reagents you use, similar to what we learned about previously as it relates to carbon oxidation. So it is possible to form various types of compounds depending on the oxidation reagents that you're using. So for example, if you recall, chromic acid is one of the 
types of compounds that could be used. We could also use potassium permanganate. And similar to those transformations that you learned about in Organic Chemistry 1, those same types of oxidation reactions can occur at benzylic carbon positions. These reactions at the benzylic position are crucial in organic synthesis, allowing chemists to introduce functional groups selectively to the benzene ring or its derivatives. Understanding the mechanisms and factors influencing these reactions is essential for designing efficient synthetic routes and exploring the reactivity of aromatic compounds. One common method of reducing benzene and its derivatives is called catalytic hydrogenation. Under these conditions, an aromatic compound, such as benzene or one of its derivatives, is introduced to hydrogen gas in the presence of a transition metal catalyst. A few examples would be nickel, platinum, or palladium. And under extremely forcing conditions, meaning at high pressures like 100 atmosphere and 150 degrees Celsius, it is possible to fully saturate this benzene ring to generate a cyclohexane ring, where all of the double bonds are now fully saturated with carbon-hydrogen bonds. With some catalysts, and under much milder conditions, it's actually possible to reduce the vinyl carbon position to generate a benzene ring with a new alkane on it. This gives us an opportunity to selectively reduce at the benzylic carbon position. And this has to do with the reactivity and stability of intermediates formed at benzyl positions. Notice that these conditions are much milder at lower atmosphere, at lower pressure, and at lower temperature. And this gives us an opportunity to add a tool to our toolbox when designing new molecules. Another notable reduction method is the Birch reduction, which specifically targets aromatic compounds containing electron withdrawing substituents, such as carbonyl groups or nitro groups. In the presence of a strong base such as sodium or lithium metal and a proton source like ethanol or ammonia, the aromatic ring undergoes reduction to form a diene or cyclohexadiene intermediate. The Birch reduction is actually really cool and I highly recommend that you try this reaction out on your own so that you can see the visual appealing stunningness of generating what we call solvated electrons. The way that this mechanism works, remember that sodium has a single valence electron which can very easily be ionized. And therefore, in this reaction, this electron, the valence electron from sodium, is actually going to form a new anion at one of the carbon positions. And this, if you followed along with the electron pushing arrows, generates, in addition to that, a single radical. So if we're to draw the intermediate here, what we have now generated is a carbanion at the top position and a radical at the bottom position. Now remember, all of our other bonds that we formed are also still there. And recall that I mentioned that in order for this reaction to proceed, we needed a hydrogen donor like methanol to also be present in this system. So therefore, what can happen is this anion can deprotonate the hydrogen atom from methanol to therefore generate another intermediate, which now contains two hydrogen atoms at the top and leaves behind our radical at the bottom position. And therefore, if we had another sodium metal present, which can again donate that single valence electron, this could generate another carbanion at the bottom position. So now we have placed two hydrogen atoms at the top. We still have a single hydrogen atom at all of the other positions, and we still have those two double bonds. Now that we have generated this second carbanion, remember we still have plenty of methanol in our reaction which can again be deprotonated in order to form a reduced cyclohexadiene compound. Now let's explore the intriguing world of heteroaromatic compounds. Unlike traditional aromatic compounds composed solely of carbon atoms, heteroaromatic compounds contain one or more heteroatoms such as nitrogen, oxygen, or sulfur within the aromatic ring. These heteroatoms impart unique reactivity and properties to the aromatic system. Pyridine and pyrrole or pyrrole are two different types of heteroaromatic compounds that exist because they satisfy all of the rules required for aromaticity.
Importantly, pyridine is an example of a compound that will readily act as a base or a nucleophile and deprotonate some acid to generate a fully protonated system leaving behind a proton or a protonated species. Importantly, this compound, which has been protonated, is still aromatic, which is why this reaction occurs. Now, if we're to consider pyrrole or pyrrole, which also has a lone pair, which can act as a nucleophile, if we were to react this compound with another acid, this reaction of deprotonation would not occur. And the reason for that is because pyrrole the product that would be formed would actually no longer have aromaticity. And to understand why there are subtle differences, even though both starting compounds, pyridine and pyrrole, are aromatic, we need to understand when a lone pair constitute as part of a conjugated system and when it does not. In order to fully understand these differences, it's important to take a molecular orbital approach. Recall that at each of the pi bonds, there is an unhybridized p orbital, which is interacting with the adjacent atoms, which contain the same orbital in the same phase. Now importantly, this p orbital, which is in conjugation with the other orbitals, is the same going in the same direction as all of the adjacent p orbitals. And therefore, this lone pair of electrons is actually in a different orbital, not pointing in the same plane. Now let's take a look at parole. Again, we have our orbitals, which are going in the same direction and interacting with one another in full conjugation. And the same is true for this lone pair. This lone pair is fully conjugated with the adjacent p orbitals to make those aromatic delocalized electrons. Now notice then, if this lone pair is in this orbital and we were to do something like try to attack an acid, what would happen is that if you were to produce the product, you would be taking up this p orbital lone pair of electrons. The same is not true for pyridine because it has these two different perpendicular p orbitals where the lone pair is in one and the other orbital is involved in conjugation to the neighboring atoms. Because of that, even if it were to react with an acid and deprotonate that acid, it still leaves behind that orbital that is fully conjugated to the adjacent atoms. Whereas the same would not be true if you were to uh, occupy that orbital by protonation. So not only does it have to satisfy things like Huckel's rule, like being 4n plus 2, pi electrons. It has to be cyclic. All the adjacent carbons inside of the ring have to be conjugated. But we also need to consider the direction of the orbitals, both before and after what might happen during a reaction. Let's try a few practice problems to gauge your learning. Pause the video and try these problems, then resume the video to see an explanation of the answers. When evaluating the first molecule for discerning whether or not the lone pairs are participating in aromaticity, the first and easiest portion that we can identify is this nitrogen with the lone pair on it. Notice that it is not participating in the cyclic portion or the ring structure of the aromatic compound. This, for this reason, it is impossible for this nitrogen lone pair to be contributing to aromaticity. Now for the other two examples, both of the nitrogen atoms are a part of that cyclical structure. We also see that we have 4n plus 2 pi electrons satisfying Huckel's rule. All of the pi orbitals are in conjugation with one another. So we need to evaluate whether or not the lone pairs at each nitrogen are actually a part of that conjugation. So for the first example, the nitrogen on the top, we know that in order for this to be conjugated, that that lone pair of electrons must be in a pi or, or a p orbital which can be conjugated to the adjacent atom. Importantly, it is also conjugated to the other neighboring atom. Now notice that this pi bond can only form via the overlap of two unhybridized p orbitals, which means that the p orbital involved in the pi bond here is already taken up. So this lone pair must then be in something like an sp2 hybridized orbital, which would be perpendicular 
and thus not participating in conjugation. Therefore, this nitrogen is also not participating in aromaticity, and only the single nitrogen at the top left is. Now let's evaluate this synthetic route. The first step is what's known as radical halogenation, specifically radical bromination. Recall that bromine gas, in the presence of a sufficiently energetic light, you can break that bond between the two bromine atoms to form a diradical. Now when you do that, we can undergo radical halogenation, as we've reviewed in this video, to form a product where we now have formed a benzylic bromide. And this benzylic bromide can undergo transformations that you will have learned about in previous chemistry courses. For example, a substitution reaction. This allows us to synthesize a benzyl alcohol. For the Birch reduction question, we need to talk about an important concept that we haven't reviewed yet. And that has to do with whether or not substituents on the benzene ring are electron donating groups or electron withdrawing groups. So importantly, we need to consider these factors when discerning whether or not a re Birch reduction can actually occur. It turns out that electron donating groups destabilize the radical anion that's formed as an intermediate during a Birch reduction. Therefore, we typically do not see reduction of benzene if there is an electron donating substituent. However, when we have an electron withdrawing group, we do see reduction at the carbons that are connected to that electron withdrawing group. And again, this has to do with the stabilization of the radical anion that's formed as an intermediate as part of that mechanism. Therefore, when we're evaluating our compound, we need to discern if this molecule is going to be reduced, at which location and at which carbon is actually going to be reduced. And for that, again, we need to consider whether or not the portions on the, on the benzene or the aromatic compound are electron withdrawing or electron donating. If you recall from previous chemistry courses, this carbonyl compound is what is called electron withdrawing. So we would call this electron withdrawing group. Alkyl groups are what are called electron donating groups. So therefore, we would consider this portion to be an electron donating group. So therefore, I would not expect the adjacent carbon to be reduced. And in fact, this would be the carbon that I would expect to be reduced first. So therefore, when considering what our product is actually going to look like, I need to keep that in mind, which means that the product that would be formed during this Birch reduction would only be when you generate these no longer conjugated dienes in these specific carbon positions. And again, this is because this portion is connected to the electron withdrawing group, whereas this portion is connected to the electron donating group. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Additionally, if you have any questions about the content we covered here today or any chemistry related content, please leave it in the comment section down below and I'd love to respond to your video. Until next time, thanks again.